Hello, everybody, and welcome to Titan Talk, a San Marino High School teacher-hosted, interview-formatted, bi-monthly podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Peter. And I'm Andrew. And this is a podcast where we highlight two kinds of educators, those who have something of value to say in regards to teaching, learning, testing, and wellness, and those who have a personal story worth sharing. Thank you all so much for joining us today for Episode 5 of the SMHS Titan Talk Podcast. Also joining us today is Mary Vale High School AP U.S. History teacher, Adam Norris. Maryvale High School is located near Buffalo, New York, and Adam has been teaching there since 2006. Over the years, he's become known as both an outstanding U.S. history teacher and as someone who has produced an ever-increasing number of high-quality, three-to-five-minute YouTube videos designed to teach AP U.S. history students everywhere what they need to know to pass the annual exam. For the production of these videos, Adam has become enormously popular. I would even go so far as to say that Adam has become every AP U.S. History student's best friend. Adam is here with us today to detail the story of how and why he became such a popular YouTube content delivery celebrity. He'll also tell us how and why he became a high school U.S. History teacher. If time permits, he will let us know what he thinks about all the changes that the College Board brought to the world of AP U.S. history this past summer. So without further ado, our interview with Adam Norris. Hey, Adam, it's so great to have you here today. I know how busy you are, and I very much appreciate you taking the time to answer a few questions for us. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Adam, what I want to start off with is a number. How many videos have you made? So I've made over 500 videos for YouTube, and about 400 of those have been AP U.S. History videos. About another 52 or 53 have been AP government prior to the redesign of the curriculum two years ago. And then I've also made some AP World videos, and I'm currently doing a U.S. History curriculum with a co-teacher that I've been co-teaching with for about the past six or seven years. We've been going through the New York State United States History curriculum, and I have about 35 of those videos as well. So the number is somewhere around 500 total. I, I don't know the exact number. And each of these videos is approximately five to 10 minutes, something like that? The majority are, yeah. I found over the years that the sweet spot for delivery tends to be about 10 minutes, I think, at the most. I do have longer videos. When I first started, I was doing chapter review videos. Some of those are 15, 20 minutes. And then my final exam video for APUSH, I have two of them that are 38 and 42 minutes, I believe. But for the overwhelming majority of the videos I make, they're 10 minutes or less. You know, I hadn't planned on asking you this question, but as you're talking, I I figured I got to throw this one in there. Have you yet calculated up the total amount of time that it's taken you to produce all of these videos and then uh, factored in your teacher's salary to see what you would have earned had you have been paid for all of this? I'm pretty scared to look at it. Uh, I do know that on average, a 10-minute video takes about three hours by the time I do some research, create the PowerPoint, record, and edit the whole thing and then upload it to YouTube. So if I have 500 videos at, let's just say 10 minutes each, that's 5,000 hours, and then multiply that by quite a bit. I, I, I would have to do some more math, but it's 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 a lot of Friday and Saturday nights that I spent doing this. And uh, first couple of years, I was making a video you know, the day before that I would have my students watch it for homework that night. So I, uh, I'm very lucky to have a very understanding wife who supports what I do. So that's a big help. Very nice. What caused you to make the videos, Adam? So it's kind of an interesting story. Back in 2012, I began making chapter review videos of the textbook that I was doing. And it just started on a whim. A good friend of mine and mentor who was teaching a, a push before me, he had made some videos before and kind of introduced me to the idea of it. And I had made my PowerPoint. So I thought it would be a good idea to to kind of have a backup for students that missed the day of class or were out for whatever reason. So a lot of things kind of went right in the fall of 2012. And at the same time I made my first video, within a week or two, there was this grant opportunity. It was very vague, but it promised a lot of technology if you were interested in joining. And at the time, there weren't a lot of computers or laptops or Chromebooks in classes. If we wanted to use a computer lab, we would have to fight with other teachers to sign out the lab. And I saw this grant opportunity that said, "Would you essentially, would you be willing to build 
an online course for AP teachers of all subjects. And in return, you could get computers and various technology for your classroom. And I just I'll be honest, I looked at the computers and I thought how much I could do in the classroom. So on a whim, I kind of applied for it, didn't think much of it, and just continued at that time making about a video per week for each chapter that I was doing in the curriculum. And I continued with that for about six months. And in March of 2013, I heard that I got accepted for the grant and I met up with 10 neighboring districts. And there were five other AP U.S. history teachers there. And one of them recognized me from my videos, which I I was blown away by. Um, I didn't realize that other teachers were, were watching the videos. And he said he shared them with his class because they had used the same textbook. And the following year, the grant continued. It was a two or three year grant. We had all made a commitment to produce videos as part of this online course. And my role in the group was to produce the videos and other teachers did other things to build the course. And the next year I started essentially breaking down they push curriculum and creating on average three to four videos per week to supplement what the chapter review videos would be. So I would have students watch three videos on smaller topics within that chapter. And then the end of the week for Friday, they would watch the chapter review video that would cover everything. So what started out as that has grown into quite the obsession. I've done many videos on they push curriculum, especially since the change in 2015. I was inspired to even do AP government videos. And then last year I started teaching AP World and I started doing some of those videos as well. Adam, if people are listening to this podcast and they have never seen any of your videos, they go on to Google and they put in your name and they search up an A push video or a AP World History video, which one would you want them to see first? I think the one that I'm most excited about and most proud about is coincidentally happens to be the most popular video. It's my periods one through five review video of a push that covers the first half of the curriculum that I did in 2015 with the redesign of the a push curriculum. I spent countless hours, I think probably 30 or 40 hours on that video, uh, researching, just going through the curriculum, highlighting stuff, figuring out important words that students need to know that was specifically mentioned in the curriculum, a, a running joke in my classroom, and they did for their a pusher one year was it's specifically mentioned in the curriculum because I say it so much. So I've, I've come to appreciate the curriculum as a useful tool and resource. And, and I tell the students, if it's in there, it's fair game. And I really spent a lot of time pouring over the curriculum and just going into detail with them, making sure I covered that video. And I, I divided it up by time period. I explained how much each time period was a part of the course and what key ideas from each time period you were likely to see. So that's probably the one I'm most proud of. I have a sentimental spot for chapter 13 of the American pageant. That was the first year I did those videos. I remember that video about a week after I showed it or I produced it, it had 328 views on YouTube. And I remember being so excited because I had 43 students. And I thought, wow, there's actually people beyond my own students watching these videos. So to have 43 in class students watch them, and then 328 in addition to that was pretty exciting. So those two are uh, sentimental ones for me, but I'm, I'm really proud of all of them. And it, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully it's helping students throughout the country. Adam, that's great stuff. When you, when you continue to share this passion with your current students and you release a new video, I have two questions. Do you tell them you're releasing a new one? And what's the general reaction you get if you do tell them? I, I do tell them, and I still need to finish the A push curriculum. I meant to do it this year, but time kind of got away from me. So last year in particular, when I redid the curriculum in order, I call them the videos in order, and I, I took the redesign curriculum and just really went into the design curriculum, and I really just put them in order and based my instruction off of that. And the students were pretty excited every time I would do a new one. I would always give shout-outs to different classes of people that are watching the videos, and uh, every day my 
my students would ask, can we please get a shout out? Can we please get a shout out? And I did in one of my videos and they were very appreciative of that. In regard to the, the feedback or the reception, I've been incredibly blessed to have really overwhelming support from teachers and students that watch my videos. I've learned the hard way that you cannot cover uh, cover words with pictures. My first couple years, I would constantly put a picture of something over the words and when students are writing it down in the notes sheet I provide them, they would have to go back or wait till the slide ended when I would have all the pictures disappear. So now I'm able to have pictures side by side. So the biggest complaint I've gotten was that pictures were covering the words too much. So I've, I learned the hard way after many comments that I should keep the pictures off the, the words. So Adam, the, the question I have now is these videos, do you actually show them to your students in class or are you only having your students watch these outside of class? Predominantly outside of class. On any given night, I tell my students in the beginning of the year they can expect to watch almost a video a night in addition to other homework that they'll have. The times that I have them watch in class tends to be a day or two before a test. I like to take time to review with students. So I have these review sheets with links to my videos that students will watch. And while they're watching them individually and completing the review sheets, I'll take some students aside and work with them and just, you know, quiz them or ask them what questions they have and work individually with them, talk about essays, things like that. So while I'm doing small group instruction, the rest of the class is kind of going at their own pace. But in terms of them watching my videos as a whole, as a class as a whole, that really only happens on days that I'm not there. Um, whether it's I'm sick or at a conference or something, Bill, that will help alleviate some of the instruction that I'm not there for. You know, I'm an A-push teacher and I show, I'm not sure exactly how many of your videos in a given year, but there are certainly a, a fair share number. Sometimes I let the video speak for itself. I put up the key concept, uh, the evidence that supports the concept, and then just let your video run. Other times I may do the introductory teaching or I may teach it and then just show your video as reinforcement. But I do show a fair share number. I, I know literally hundreds of A-Push teachers across this country who do the same, who, who show your videos in class and have great things to say about it. So Adam, uh, what about videos that are produced by guys like Tom Ritchie, Stephen Heimler? Do you show their videos to your students? I do. Both of them have been a huge help for me, particularly when it comes to the written portion of essay or the structure of the the DBQ, the LEQ, or even the SAQ. Tom, I've been using his rubric for years. And last year, around this early last year, I discovered Stephen Heimler and his videos on the DBQ and LEQ have been invaluable, especially with all that's going on with the uh, exams this year, with the restructured format of it just being a DBQ. I relied heavily, particularly on Heimler history for the DBQ for both my APUSH and AP World students. So I'm very grateful. I don't have a lot of videos on writing. Mine is more focused on content. So I definitely use Tom and Steve to help out in that regard. That logo of yours, the one with the red baseball cap and the mustache and the outline map of the United States, what's that all about? So I'm very lucky to have a, a wife who is an artist, and we had been talking for years after I created my website that we needed some sort of logo, and I was really struggling, and she came up with it completely on, on her own. She tied in my love for the Cincinnati Reds. I've made more than one reference to my love for all things Cincinnati. I used to live there when I was younger, and I'm a huge Reds fan, so the red hat comes from there, and she put a push on it, and the Reds mascot has a mustache very similar to the mustache mustache that is on the logo. So that really is the influence of Cincinnati and the work of my wife, because there's no way I could create that on my own. Adam, I have never made a quality YouTube video, nothing that comes close to the kind of stuff you're doing. But it is certainly something after listening to you talk that I'm, I'm very interested in. If I were to go down that path, what's the best advice you can, you can give me? I think just doing it and being willing to, to commit some time to it. The grant in particular for me that I referenced earlier was a huge help because I knew other teachers were relying on me within the grant, and it really forced me to just commit to it all in that year when I was producing three to four videos a week. And that's not to say that, that you have to start off doing that, but it was it was really good for me. It was a, a good time in my life where I, had, where I could dedicate the time to do that. Um, in terms of starting, I always tell teachers that I work with and, and 
run into that what I would do is just start a review for a unit or something you really enjoy doing. What is what is a topic you like? What is a review unit you want you would want to cover? And that way for the end of the year or for the test that they're taking, they will have the material there for them. So if you look at, you know, in A push there's nine units and I review videos for each each period in, in about ten minutes or so. And if you divide up the number of units or periods that you're teaching each year and you just start with one review video for that at the end of the year the whole curriculum is essentially done or the big ideas then you can go back and get more in depth in individual videos I, I would not hesitate to start with goal of 10 to 12 videos the first year and just focus on review ones and then go from there and be prepared it's highly addictive and it, it you'll you'll find that your students will benefit greatly from it what is your biggest challenge when you're making these aside from we know how much time you spend and that clearly has got to be a challenge but what else is another challenge you have when you make them? You know, I'll be honest. I, I love doing these videos so much and I've done them for so many years. I don't really see anything as a challenge other than the time it takes to commit to making them. It, it's a lot of fun and I don't look at it as, as a challenge aside from setting aside enough time to produce them. What about, a little different kind of question here. I've, I've seen a lot of your videos. I don't think I've ever seen you put your face to the video. Is that a challenge for you, a camera shy issue, or what's that all about? So I'm, I am pretty introverted, uh, even though on the videos I'm much more animated than I am in my personal life. Uh, I, there are a couple videos that I, I have shown my face in. Uh, one in particular, my dog even makes an appearance. It's a video about Lyndon Johnson. It's titled The Presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. What I, I did probably four or five videos total with my face in them, and I, I had a lot of my students say that, you know, it was weird because my face was bouncing around to not get in in the way of the words and I found that I wasn't as animated and more self-conscious with my picture or my face in it so I just decided to stick behind the powerpoints instead Adam, I've never taught an AP class yet. I currently teach world history and U.S. government for the regular class. Do you have any videos that would fit those curriculums? I don't for regular U.S. government, and I only have, I think, three videos for world history. This goes back to 2015, I believe. I was teaching what we call New York State Global Two, which is world history from essentially the Enlightenment to present day. And I was producing videos. I was teaching Global Two then, and I produced a couple videos on World War II and the Industrial Revolution, and it really was hard to, to keep up with that while I was producing so many A-Push videos, and I always meant to go back to the Global 2 video, but I my schedule changed, and I then began to only teach U.S. history and A-Push, so my focus was on, on those two. Uh, government, I have not taught a regular government class, and although my PowerPoints and videos are based on AP government, I do have a former student who is now a teacher in Virginia, and she said that she uses my PowerPoint. She's modified them for her class that she teaches government in. So I think, um, although it may be more in-depth than a regular class, there certainly could be value from, you know, anybody's AP videos for students, especially that are interested in learning more, for sure. Adam, we started off today's podcast by asking you a number of questions about your videos. And at this point, I think Andrew and I would uh, like to shift the focus of the interview to some other topics. But before we go there, is there anything else you would like to say about the videos? No, I think we covered everything. I, I appreciate you giving me the platform to, to discuss a very big passion of mine. So thank you. I'm assuming being a teacher is also a passion of yours, aside from the videos. Uh, detail for us, will you please, how um, how and why did you become a teacher? So interesting story. I, I Growing up, my father always talked about how important education was. He grew up in a very rural, poor area of of New York State, and he had a math teacher that essentially convinced my dad to go to college. College was not necessarily the expectation. Uh, he was the first person to graduate from a four-year college in his family, and growing up, he just always stressed the importance of school and education, and I've been blessed throughout the years to have many good teachers. I think back to third grade when I moved to Buffalo from Cincinnati. I had a, one of my favorite teachers, Mrs. Gervais, who was just funny and kind and and um, would always joke around and really just not the, the normal and really just was a, a welcoming person. And in high school, I was blessed to have three of three more tremendous teachers. I had a French
French teacher who greeted us at the door every day, and that's one thing I tried to do with my students all the time. I had a U.S. history teacher who was amazing, inspired me to become a U.S. history teacher, and I had an English teacher as well who was great. But really, I think the defining moment, I had always thought about teaching, but my junior year of high school, my father died after uh, a long battle with cancer, which weirdly goes back to the first day of high school. I was called down to the office and told uh, to call my dad's friend who was in the hospital with my dad, and we found out the first day of school that my dad had cancer, and he ended up succumbing to it in, in May of my junior year. And my U.S. history teacher really reached out to me and really kind of demonstrated that, you know, he cared about me as much as he cared about me doing well in school. And that really kind of opened my eyes to what impact teaching could have beyond just learning the content. And that I pretty much made up my mind around that time that not only did I know I wanted to be a teacher, but I wanted to be the teacher that inspired or changed people and obviously has high expectations for my students, but also, you know, wants to connect with them and let them know that I care about them as an individual as well. Adam, thank you for sharing that about your personal life. What else can you tell us? You're, are you married? Do you have kids? What about your hobbies and your interests? What sports do you like? So I am married. Uh, funny story, my, my wife and I got married in August of 2006, and two weeks later I finished my master's degree. A week after that, I got hired at Maryvale. The, I started at Maryvale, and then a week after that we bought our house that we're currently in. So four major life-changing things occurred within the one month of each other of 2006. And we currently have a three, soon to be four-year-old son. And next week, we're expecting the birth of our second child, another son. And we have a, a dog as well. And we're super excited to welcome this new addition. In terms of hobbies, I love to read. I am a biography and memoir junkie. I, I will. There's a biography on a famous person, especially somebody I like. I'll read as much as I can about that. Them. I've really gotten into memoirs lately, current events memoirs. And hobbies, I, I love, uh, in terms of other interests, I love baseball. I'm a, a huge Cincinnati Reds fan. As my students often remind me, they're not very good, but I'm a loyal, devout fan to them and uh, a Buffalo Bills fan as well. So really, in my free time, I prefer to just watch the Reds or the Bills and read and, of course, spend time with my family. As a Bills fan, you had a little bit of a run at it at the beginning of the season last year. Could have gone either way, right? We did, yeah. It was uh, it was exciting. It was uh, not the, the best end to the season after being up quite a bit in the playoffs. But uh, for a town that hasn't had seen the playoffs in 17 years, we've had two out of the past three years. So we're pretty pumped for it. Adam, when I was a young boy, I think I was in seventh or eighth grade, one of my father's friends received five tickets to see up close in the studio with Roy Firestone, which used to be on ESPN. And the day that we went down to the LA studio, we were going to watch the interview with Pete Rose. Pete decided to stay around. And after the show, he gave us tickets to his then restaurant in the stadium and he autographed them for us. And I remember him being such a, a kind man at the time, but I also remember him squeezing my hand so hard that it felt like it was going to fall off. I'll never, that was the hardest handshake I've ever had in my life. And every time I watch a, a, a Reds game now, I think about Pete Rose in that stadium. And one day I should, I should use my ticket. I still have it. It's framed, you know? That's a great story. I've, I've never met any of the big Reds players. Someday Barry Larkin is on my uh, bucket list to, to run into, but um, Pete Rose is a blood figure in Cincinnati for sure. Oh, absolutely. Boy, I, I'm not sure where to take this. I was going to, next question was going to head in the direction of your views on college board, but how do you move a bit away from baseball so easily? <laughs> but in any event, um, the changes college board has brought forward last summer, AP classroom, all of that, the, the new CEDs, plus the redesigns of the U, uh, A push curriculum. What do you think about all of that? I am a huge fan of what they did. And, and honestly, it's something I, I've been waiting for for years. I didn't know what kind of product I wanted to see, but they certainly exceeded my expectations. I think AP Classroom is an amazing resource. One of my complaints prior to it was just a lack of adequate practice questions, AP, true AP practice questions for students. And AP Classroom has opened up just an enormous amount of, of questions for students to practice with, especially with the redesign of the document that students have to interpret. I think the more practice they get, the better they'll, they'll get at it. And in terms of the curriculum, I think it's great as well. Um, I'm very impressed with 
the units, they, they go in order, and you really, that, that book has become instrumental in my teaching. When I first started teaching AP, I really relied heavily on the textbook, and I taught essentially a chapter a week or, cha- or two chapters a week. And now the focus is not really on my textbook at all, but rather the CED and how I can tie the curriculum into my classroom. So I'm I'm a really big fan. And especially for AP World this year, the AP World course changed drastically. That was a big help for me teaching that this year as well. So I'm, I'm very appreciative for what College Board did. Adam, how many students did you have this year that took an AP test? So all my students took the AP test. We're kind of a smaller school. So I usually have about two sections per year, averaging around 45 A-push students. And then AP World, there's only one section, and that's usually around 25-ish students. Last year, I had 28. This year, I had a little bit less. So total AP students are in the 60s, um, low 70s, and everyone takes the exam. Uh, and this year, did you have any major problems, tech issues, anything like that at all? I did have one of my students in A push. Uh, she wrote her essay and then went to submit it, and then the screen went to nothing. So she did have to apply and then successfully retook the later exam. So she, unfortunately, uh, was was the only one who had tech issues. Other than that, I didn't hear any complaints from any other students. I had 127 APUSH students take the test. Uh, we have a number of sections of AP, Gov, similar amount of, of kids. We didn't have any problems. Maybe one, two like you, but all in all, it looked like uh, the system they put Ford worked really well. I realized some people had some problems, but uh, I'm, I'm hearing numbers of worked well over 90% or something like that. I, I've heard the same. I agree. Yeah, I think overall they did very well for the time that they had and the, what they needed to do for sure. Adam, so Andrew and I, our school shut down Friday, March 13th. School for us officially ended just this past Friday. And so basically we were out at home for two months. And I'm curious in that period of time, you were probably home for two months as well, right? School shut down? Yeah, school also for us, our last day was Friday, March 13th as well. During this period of time of school shutdown, staying at home, what has been your coping strategy other than making videos? So I actually, from your Trevor Packer podcast, I was listening to it and Trevor planted a seed in my head about my next project for A-Push that I'm currently working on. And not to tease it too much, I I don't want to reveal what it is yet, but it's going to be hopefully done by the beginning of August on my website. And I think it will be an enormous resource for teachers and students in particular. And if it goes how I think it's going to go, it will probably be the thing I'm most proud of having done. So I've spent a lot of time working on this. It was just, you know, listening to your interview and it was something he said that kind of gave me, planted the seed of, of creating something new. So I've spent a lot of time working on that. I have spent a lot of time reading, you know, trying to keep up with, with current events and trying to think how I can apply this to what I'll be teaching next year. Well, okay, so this is interesting. You and I do talk, but you have not shared this with me. But now I will share with you that he also planted a seed in my mind. And as you were talking, I'm saying to myself, oh my gosh, I can bet that I can guess what you were going to do or what you are doing. As for me personally, I've done a similar thing. I put in a lot of time once that seed got planted and we'll be bringing that forward as well. They won't be videos, but my guess is they will go side by side with what you're doing. And maybe we can talk about that after we end the podcast. Definitely. Adam, on behalf of Titan Talks, San Marino High School, and all the other AP and regular history teachers around the United States. I would like to say thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor and pleasure for you to be here and to gift us with your presence and your knowledge. And we hope to have you come back and do another podcast in the future. It's, it's really been fun. Absolutely. This has been a pleasure, and I can't thank you enough for having me and let me talk about a, a very big passion of mine. So thank you. And Adam, you know, a big passion of mine is uh, teaching to the CED. I think that's a best way to get students ready for the test. And it also frees teachers up, gives them the time to do other things in the class. And uh, given how much you help teachers stay focused on that CED and the students stay focused on the CED, I can't thank you enough. So, you know, I've been a big supporter of yours ever since I found your videos, and I really appreciate all the support that you have given my students. Um, I want to thank you for being here today and wish you a a great summer and a great school year next year. Thank you so much, you too, and, and appreciate your support so much. It means a lot. So thank you.